Welcome back to Family Church. Like Jeremy said, I am Pastor Mike. I have the pleasure of leading this wonderful church. Uh, we are in a series called Unguarded. This is the third week. If you missed the first two weeks, please go back to our YouTube page, watch it, catch up to where we are, what we're talking about. We are talking about the steps that Peter took or the events that happened to the moment that Peter denied knowing Jesus, all right? Peter's first mistake was that he had an unguarded gift. He tried to bank on his gift, talk his way out of this situation, right? The second one was that he had an unguarded heart. When Jesus asked him to go pray, protect yourself, guard your heart, he did not. So when a situation came, he had a heart attack, he had some heart pain, and he acted out in a way that was unbecoming of him. Today, we're gonna talk about Peter's unguarded step. His unguarded step. To this point, we have been reading Luke's account of that night. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John kind of parallel each other. They kind of tell the same stories. But Matthew kind of tells it a little bit differently. So we're going to look at Matthew's account today in Matthew 26, verse 31. And yes, this is going to be long. We're going to take our time to read it. Uh, 31 through 58. And it says this. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. All right, so let's just pause there for a second. It was already prophesied that this was gonna happen, so Jesus wasn't surprised when it happened. Okay? Now, again, I gotta, I gotta explain this because I, I think for some reason the church world just doesn't understand it. God is omniscient, he's omnipresent, he operates outside of time and space. God, give, God gave us time as a gift. He said, I'll make the sun rise and I'll make the sun set. That gave us time. He, he gave us a time frame so that our minds would not be bugging out. But God operates outside of time and space. And so when God forgave you, when you made him your Lord and Savior and he forgave you, he forgave your whole life. He didn't for only forgive the things that you had done up to that point. He forgave you completely. So I say all that to say this. God isn't surprised when you do something bad. You'd never catch God by surprise. This night, Jesus knew there was a prophecy. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. The flock will be scattered. So he wasn't surprised that when he got arrested, they all scattered. Get it? God's not surprised by your missteps. God's not surprised when you mess up. He already knew it and he already forgave you. Like he, he factored that in when he accepted you as his child. Watch this. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. What a great church boy. Even if everybody else is messing up, I will never mess up. I'm a perfect Christian. This is that old saying. If everybody jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge, would you jump off the Brooklyn Bridge? Peter, no. I would be the only one not to do it, right? That's what he's saying here. Even if all the other disciples, I will not. This is self-righteousness. Jesus says back to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, not any night, tonight, right, right now, tonight, coming out your mouth, making this bold declaration, but tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me not one time, not two times, but three times. And then Peter said back to him. Again, Peter's trying to use his gift, his persuasion. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Be very careful when people promise you the moon. 
because they probably won't even get off the earth. Can I give somebody a business lesson real quick? In sales, someone who's trying to be a salesperson, promise less, deliver more. Promise less, deliver more. Because you come out your mouth, promising somebody all these future features, and then you can't deliver on that. Now you're a liar. Now you're a crook. Now you're a thief. Now you got a bad Google review. Right? Got, got only two stars on Yelp instead of five. And everybody's going to go look at that before they hire you. Under-promise, over-deliver. Now Peter's over-promising, and he's about to under-deliver. I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Yeah, what he said. Me too. I won't deny you either. Then Jesus came to them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here a while. Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons, sons of Zebedee. So he took, it was Peter, James, and John. So Jesus had 12 disciples, but he had three in his inner circle. Everybody needs a close friend. Everybody needs someone that they can turn to in a tough time. Yes, you may have 10,000 followers on Facebook, but when you're feeling bad about life, who do you call? I bet it's less than three people. And for most men, 80% of men in America do not have someone that they consider to be a best friend. Someone who has access to their stories, their struggles, and their secrets. Men, we need to do better with this. Men, we need to find other men that we can be vulnerable with and help us through tough seasons of our lives. Jesus knew he had Peter, James, and John. And even though they were his closest, they would still abandon him. And he began to sorrowfully and deeply distress, he began to pray. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face. So he left the three and he went a little bit further. The Bible, in in uh, uh, Luke, it said that he was a stone's throw away. So even though he was with his three, he still had to get personally alone with God and pray. He went a little further, got on his face. He said, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came back and found the disciples sleeping. He said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Right? The unguarded heart didn't put the work in. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, Jesus went and prayed. Oh, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your will be done. He came back and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed a third time, saying the same words, if this cup pass from me. Let it be, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas one of the 12, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus, and this was not a healing line, this was not that they came and laid hands on him, anointed him with oil. They came and laid hands to rough him up, all right? They laid hands on him and took Jesus. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hands and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. They don't name him. It's like one of those things like, I'm not gonna say who it was, but somebody took a sword, so they were like, we're not gonna name him, but it was Peter. Peter took the sword, cut this guy's ear off, and again, I said this to you last week, the only reason why he cut the guy's ear off was because he was not a swordsman and he missed the guy's neck. 
he was trying to cut his head off. He was trying to kill the guy. The guy kind of did one of those things like cut his ear off. Jesus said back to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot pray to my father and that he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? I love that part. Wait a second. Wait a second. Let me, let me, just, let me just get you to see this for a second. You think these guys could actually arrest me? Do you think this group of people could actually take me? No, 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 no. I could just say, yo, send the posse. And all 12 legions of angels come and got my back and knock these dudes out. I'm going willingly. There's no need to fight here. I've got to fulfill my mission. I've got to fulfill what I was created for. Come on, this is what he's saying here. Do you think that I cannot pray and God would send me 12 legions of angels? How then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and a club to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples, watch, forsook and fled. Prophecies fulfilled. The shepherd will be struck and the flock will flee. It just happened. They forsook and fled. And those who laid a hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Watch this, ready? But Peter, the one who I will die for you, I will go to prison with you. But Peter followed Jesus at a distance. I got you back, Jesus. Way back. Way, way back. I remember in high school, in high school I got into a fight with like a really big guy. And anybody ever seen a high school fight? Come on, everybody seen a high school fight? The, fight. the fight starts, the circle appears, right? Everybody gets in a circle around it. Don't let the teachers get in, but they want to see you get in the front row action. So circle, whole hallway crowd going on. All my friends, front row seats. They made the circle and did nothing for your boy. Did nothing for your boy. Now, when I tell you I was in a fight, the dude was over seven feet tall. I ain't even exaggerating. I ain't even exaggerating. Am I exaggerating, Miss Sue? You work at Pine Bush. You know you were there. She saw the circle. <laughs> All my boys. Yo, if it got real bad, we were jumping in. I was getting my head bashed into the lockers. What do you mean if it got real bad? I promise you, straight out, I have never spoken to any of them since that day. I don't hold no grudge. I don't hold no grudge. I hold a little chichon still right here in the back of my head, a little knot. I don't, but you ain't my friend. I love you, you need something, I'll reach out. But you ain't my friend. Oh, we got your back. Something happens, we got your back. You were so far back that you couldn't get to me, right? That's what Peter's doing. I got your back, Jesus, I'll die for you. But... Okay. It's like when you're trying to follow somebody in the car, but you want to make sure you stay far enough back so they don't see your car, so they don't know you're following. That's what Peter was doing. I don't want anybody to see me following. He followed at a distance. And he went and he sat down with some servants by a fire. Let's be for real for a second, okay? Can we? Put this up on the screen. We are all prone to follow Jesus at a distance. We are all prone to follow Jesus at a distance. And if you're one who says, not me! Whatever the Lord needs me to do, I'm there. And he says, give your paycheck to your neighbor. Whoa, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Speaking things of the devil. Uh, Jesus. God would never ask me to do that. He might. 
He might, but just know that if he's asking you to do something like that, it's because he needs an avenue to bless you even more exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. Come on, somebody. We are all prone to follow Jesus at a distance. We are all prone to follow Jesus at our comfort zone. No? I want to follow Jesus whatever he wants, but I can't get into worship. I can't sing these songs. You deserve the glory? What's glory anyway? Google it! Look it up. What do you mean? Like, we're all prone to follow Jesus at a distance. It can be easy at times to fall behind while trying to follow such a great leader like Jesus. I'm not convinced that Peter did this intentionally. I know some people think he did, but I don't think he did. I think that he just found himself falling back. He was so hurt over the situation. He wanted a leader that would fight for him and with him, and he didn't get that. Yep, there are some times that we choose to follow Jesus at a distance because of what getting too close might cost us. Getting really close to the presence of God is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. And the pain level in America is so low today. The pain threshold in America, anything that's uncomfortable, we want to make a law for it. Come on, somebody. Can we be for real? Like, I'm just being for real today. If it hurts me, then we need to make a law so that you can't do anything like that. Make laws to control you, but not me. Come on. Amen. Getting too close to Jesus is going to cost you something. Yeah, but I want to be close to Jesus, but I don't want to like it to hurt. I don't want to have to forgive. I don't want to have to forgive. Do you know how much power it gives me to not forgive? But you're miserable every day. Come on, it's going to cost you something. Most of us fall away from Jesus one gradual step at a time. And, and, and we still think we're following, but our giant steps have turned into baby steps. And he's still moving at the speed that he moves, and we've just kind of slowed down. So I'm not intentionally not following Jesus, but I'm not really running either. So the gap keeps getting bigger because I'm merely slowing down. Can I say that some have found themselves falling way behind Jesus during this pandemic shutdown? Falling way, way behind from where they were running, what they were doing? I mean, let's just think about this for a second. If you were part, I'm just throwing this out there. If you were part of an evangelist team that was going door to door evangelizing, you ain't doing that, right? We don't want people on our doorsteps right now. I mean, maybe DoorDash, but that's about it. <laughs> we ain't going out. I don't want anybody over, but you call DoorDash seven times a week. Dear Lord. How, how many people in America are falling further and further behind what Jesus is wanting to do in America today during this time of pandemic? Come on, let's just think about that for a second. There's thoughts that go through our mind and Maybe I'm saying this to online people because it's not anybody in the room, but we think things like, I don't need to go to church every Sunday. That's more of a tradition than a necessity. I don't need to get caught up in worship. I'm in the presence, but I don't need to like raise my hand or sing out loud. I'm mumbling in my head. I know I haven't read my Bible in a while, but isn't reading your Bible just going through the motions anyway? I don't really get anything out of it. And we make these excuses and we rationalize why we're falling behind in the things that would keep us in step and in pace with Jesus. Put this up on the screen. There are thousands of reasons we could give to explain away the gap between our heart and the presence of God. There are thousands of reasons that we could give to explain away. 
I just, I'm just, I'm working so much. You know, I've got, I've got kids. Uh, you know, my kids have sports and I'm driving all over the place. And, 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 and there's thousands of reasons we could give to explain away the gap between our hearts and God's presence. We fall away casually and gradually. It's never instantly. It's like putting on 10 pounds. You didn't put on 10 pounds because you ate one meal. It was weeks of overeating. Next thing you know, your pants don't fit, and you're like, yo, this happened overnight. Let me ask you this today. Let me ask you this today, and, and, and this sermon came out of my own soul search of where I wanted to be by this year. What's creating the distance between you and God? What's creating the distance between you and God? What's creating the gap between your heart and the presence of God? And this is not a legalistic question. This is a tension that I struggled with for all of 2020. I had come out, I don't know if you guys know this, I had come out in the beginning of 2020 and I made a bold declaration. This will be the year of Coram Deo. We had a rock that we poured oil on. We will live our lives before the eyes of God and the presence of God. And to be honest, 2020 felt like the absence of God. And if that didn't go through your mind at some point, I'm just being too transparent. At times, I felt further away from God than ever before. At times, heaven felt strangely silent to me. Praying and praying and praying, getting answers and saying, God, what do I do? Where do I go? Who do I vote for? And I felt heaven strangely silent. As a staff, we looked back at our steps that we had taken in 2020 where we had started and where we had ended up, the goals that we had set and what we had accomplished. And really, um, at our year-end reviews, a lot of people said, I wasted a lot of time in 2020. I wasted a lot of time that I could have done other things, but I got distracted. So it's not that we weren't following, but maybe we slowed down a little bit. Instead of three-foot pace, we were just at like a one-foot step. Come on, somebody. The scriptures say this, your word, my God, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And this was a actual statement. This was, a, this was not a figurative statement. This was actual. Uh, people who would uh, haul things couldn't hold a lantern and they didn't have flashlights. So they would strap little candlelets onto the laces of their sandals. The sandal straps would come up, or up over their calf and they would attach these little lanternettes to, their, to the straps of their sandals. And it would really only light up about three feet, about one step. And what he was saying is, is this what your word is? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But you know what our part is in that? We have to watch our step. He's lighting it up to show you where the stumbling blocks are. He's lighting it up to show you where the pitfalls are. He's lighting it up to show you where the inclines and the declines are. But it is your responsibility to watch your steps. And I just want to throw this out. Have you been watching your steps? Have you been careful about your steps? Watch this. Psalm 37, 23 says this. The steps of a righteous man are or ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. So he's saying he's made the path. He's got it lit. He's got to walk. And when you stumble, he'll hold you. He'll grab you. God gives direction to our steps, but we must take the steps. Let me illustrate it like this. You know when it's icy out, 
you're really careful how you step. If someone says, hey, be careful, it's icy out, you're like, right? And then maybe you'll even have fun with it, you know, slide, but your legs are really rigid because you know how to balance if it's icy. But have you ever washed your car in flip-flops and ran into the garage real quick to get something and those flip-flops with a little soap on the slick concrete, swoo, right? Because you weren't expecting it. You weren't watching your step. You didn't know that that combination was gonna be slick and it takes your feet right out from underneath you. You slip and fall because you were not being intentional about your steps. We have to make an intentional decision to pursue Jesus every day, to be in step with him. It takes work. It takes a plan. And here's what I know about society today. Most people in society today have no plan at all for their life. They have no plan. So, all right, let, let me break it down to something that I know. They have no, I want to lose 10 pounds. Okay, what's your plan? No, I'm just going to lose 10 pounds. Eating and doing exactly, everything exactly the same way. Well, no, obviously I'm going to eat less. But well, what are you going to eat? I don't know. I'm going to go to the gym. Okay, what kind of exercises are you going to do? You can do high reps. Are you going to do low reps? Are you can do more weight, less weight. What, what's the, I, I don't know. We're going on vacation. Really, what's the plans? I don't know, we're just going to go. I'm going to get a promotion at my job. Oh, what are the steps you can take to get the promotion? I don't know. I'm just going to look good. I'm going to show up. Come on, somebody. What's your plan? What are the steps that you are taking in life to reach your goals? I'm going to open up an investment firm, and I'm going to become a millionaire. Oh, what, what's your strategy? I don't have a strategy. It's just going to happen. I'm going to put money. I'm going to throw money at it. It's going to make money. What's your strategy? What's your business strategy? What's your marketing strategy? You have no marketing strategy? What's your business going to do? Come on, somebody. What are your steps to have a better relationship with Jesus? I don't know. I'm just going to wake up every day and say hi. <laughs> Try that with your spouse. See how long that relationship lasts. There's got to be more to this. There's got to be a plan to this. I instituted something a couple months ago. I don't even know if my wife is aware of it. I'm, I'm showing my cards right now. I'm being careful to watch my step. I don't know if I should say this or not. But I made a decision in my mind the other day, like a few months ago. Every time that I get up from the couch to go get something from the fridge, I'm gonna ask her if she wants something. Right? Instituted a few months ago. I didn't say nothing to her. I didn't tell her I was gonna do it. I won't try to get no praise for it. I don't really get any reciprocation because of it. It, don't, it, it ain't doing anything, but it does something for me. I made a, a plan. Every time I get from the couch, I'm gonna ask her if she wants anything from the kitchen, from the fridge or, or, or meal, whatever. It's a game plan. It's a strategy to better my relationship and to move it forward. Do you have a strategy? Do you have a plan? Do you have, can, can I get real? Do you have a retirement plan? Do you know when you need to start your retirement plan? 17. 17, 18 years old, you need to start your retirement plan. Front row, you need to start your retirement plan. Right? You don't need to be waiting until you're 55 years old and be like, oh man, I should have saved for retirement. I should have done something. Man, Roth IRA, 401k, it's too late. You ain't gonna make no money in that. It ain't gonna save up. I got my kids started with this idea at 17 years old, $100 a paycheck. They'll be millionaires when they retire from $100 a paycheck. Compound interest, y'all. Trying to help somebody tell you what's your plan? 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 What's your plan in the kingdom? What's your plan with your relationship with Jesus? What's creating the space between you and Jesus? 
Is it a friend group? Is it a relationship? Is it the strain and stress of your job? Is it chasing money instead of chasing God? Is it your goals and education? Is it fear? Is it laziness? Watch this. I've realized that the more noble the cause, the more we justify the distance between us and the cross. The more noble the cause. I'm working more. I took a Sunday job. I can make more money. But the distance is bigger and bigger and bigger. Working more, protecting others. I'm staying home because I don't want to get anybody else sick. You're lying. You're lying. Put a mask on. Come on, somebody. And I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to be nasty. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. But you're telling me you're not going out because you want to protect other people, but you go to a restaurant. I love you. It's the greatest excuse COVID gave us. Meanwhile, meanwhile, our soul, your soul, your spirit, man. Let me speak to your spirit. Let me get past your head. Let me get past your flesh. Let me get past being tired because you stayed up too late. Your spirit, man, is aching. Your spirit, man, is groaning for the presence of God. Your spirit, man, is aching to break through your depression and get into the presence of Almighty God who will bring you joy unspeakable and fill you with his glory. Just one taste of the presence of God can transform you from anger to joy. From a state of hating yourself to a state of seeing yourself the way God sees you. His presence. His presence. His presence bypasses your reasoning faculties. It bypasses the scars of your flesh and speaks to your spirit. Peter followed at the distance still believing that he was right and that he would never d deny Jesus. He was right cutting off the guy's ear. You can be right all day long, but if you're not in the presence of Jesus, you're wrong. Ooh! I know, I'm preaching to me. He followed at a distance, why a distance? Ready? Peter followed at the distance of his faith. Peter followed at the distance of his faith. How far away you are from Jesus right now is an indicator of your faith. It's an indicator of your faith. It's an indicator. Because faith draws you in. Faith draws you close. Faith holds you tight. Peter began to fall behind because what he had just experienced affected his trust and it had affected his faith. He allowed an experience to speak louder than his faith. And he began to fall behind. And we may not be able to connect those dots when things in life are happening. It may be like slowly eating too much and putting on 10 pounds and one day we wake up and we say, man, I feel so far from God. How did this happen? How did I get here? How did I get to this place that I feel the absence of God? And really what it's been, it's been an attack on your faith. When you find yourself falling behind, it's been an attack on your faith. Your faith has been assaulted. And that's what's beginning to create this space. For, so let's just look at it. The more noble the cause. I'm working more hours. Why? Because you have more faith in your ability to create wealth than God's ability to provide for you. It's an attack on faith. It's, it's, an, attack, it's an attack on faith. 
This is why Jesus begged Peter, pray, 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 because your faith is going to be under attack. Pray, Peter, build yourself up, strengthen your spirit, man, because a situation is going to come that you're not going to be ready for. The situation was icy, but Peter was not careful with his steps. Can I encourage you today to close the gap between your heart and the presence of God? Catch up to what God is doing right now in the world today. Stop trying to take church and and everything back to the way it used to be. What does God want to do in the land today? He's a now God. He's a now God. He's a today God. His mercies are new every morning. He doesn't say go back five years and fix it, then catch up. He's a now God. Where is he taking steps now? Where is he making moves now? I'm not just talking about pandemics. I'm talking about when tragedy strikes in your life. Don't lose time. Don't lose space with Jesus. If you want to finish the story, you can go ahead and read it in your Bible. Jesus dies on the cross. He's resurrected. He comes back and he appears to the disciples. They're out fishing and he's standing on the shore and he says, hey, you guys catch any fish? They're like, no, we've been out here all night. He goes, try on the other side of the boat. Right, he had already done this once. And at that, as they begin to catch these fish, John says, it's Jesus. Peter hears that it's Jesus. And he doesn't row the boat back to the shore. He closes the gap. He closes the gap. The moment he hears that it's Jesus, it says that he takes off his jacket and he dives out of the boat and he swims back to shore. He closes the gap because he now sees where Jesus is is close the gap close the gap I want to tell you today if your steps have been leading you away from God take a step back toward God God sees your hurts he sees your pain he sees your humanity and he has compassion on you he wants to close the gap between your heart and his presence He wants to sure up your steps so that you're standing on solid ground every day of your life. Can you trust him? Can you let him build the faith in your heart once again to close that gap? Father, we thank you today that you are tugging at our heartstrings. You are calling us closer to you. I pray, God, that you are that voice that's tugging on our heartstrings even now. That if we find ourselves in a place that is far from you, you're calling us to be closer to you. Lord, I pray right now that someone who is far from you, they would know your presence right now. They would feel the difference of what this message spoke to them today. They need a change in their life. I pray right now that their spirit man would be pumping in their chest right now and calling them to you. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I wanna offer that to you today. I will not call you down to the front or do anything weird. I just wanna pray a prayer with you. And here at Family Church, we make that very simple. We pray it all with you out loud, with our mouth, and the prayer goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you're watching us online, would you type AMEN in all capital letters in one of those chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. It will get you started in your walk with Jesus Christ. If you're in the room today, would you give me the honor of celebrating you for two seconds? If you prayed that for the very first time, would you wave at me real quick and say, hey, that was me, I prayed that today. Anybody at all real quick? Looking in the back, I see you, all right. Anybody else real quick? 
Awesome, awesome. Um, as well, there is a, a booklet right at the Welcome Center. If you go stop by there and say, hey, I raised my hand today, they will give you this booklet called Starting Point. It gets you started in your walk with the Lord. We also have another booklet called Welcome Home. It talks about Christianity. If you're interested, maybe you're on the fence, wanna know more about what Christianity is, what the expectations are, at the Welcome Center, we have that booklet as well. It is called Welcome Home. Just ask for it, they'll give it to you. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return to you void, but will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our guide and our helper today. Protect us and keep us safe as we go home today. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you.